In the previous video, we discussed amorphous silicon, which is a important material for thin film solar cells. Now we will consider a consequence of the use of amorphous silicon for the thin film device structure, namely the PIN junction. The learning objectives for this video are therefore to get familiar with the PIN junction. We will discuss what a PIN junction is and why it's used in thin film solar cells. Finally, we will discuss the purpose of the doped layers in a PIN junction. We will start our discussion by recollecting the two mechanisms for charge carrier transport in solar cells. Diffusion and drift. Diffusion is a process whereby particles tend to spread out from regions of high particle concentration into regions of low particle concentration. So if we have a cross section like the one shown here, with all the charge carriers concentrated on one side, the charge carrier density profile will resemble a block diagram. As a result of random thermal motion, there will be a net movement of the charge carriers to the low concentration region, creating a more distributed concentration profile. The current generated by, in this case, electron diffusion, is described by this equation. Here Q is the elementary charge, D is the electron diffusion coefficient, and dn over dx is the concentration gradient. The second charge carrier transport mechanism in solar cells is drift. Drift is charge particle motion in response to an electric field. Basically, if a negatively charged electron is placed in an electric field, it will experience a flux in the opposite direction of the field, so the positive end. A positively charged hole will experience a force in the direction of the electric field. Now in terms of a band diagram. The electric field flows from the positive n-type region to the negative p-type region, causing a drift of electrons towards the n-type and a drift of holes towards the p-type. The current resulting of the electron drift is described by this equation, where n is the electron concentration, mu is the electron mobility, and E is the electric field strength. The diffusion length of the minority charge carrier indicated by L is equal to the square root of the diffusion coefficient and the carrier lifetime. The diffusion length can be interpreted as the typical distance minority charge carriers diffuse before we combine with a minority charge carrier. If it, did, it therefore does not make sense for the thickness of the absorber layer to exceed the diffusion length, since electrons farthest from the n doped layer and holes farthest from the p doped layer would no longer be collected. The diffusion length of crystalline silicon is about 300 micrometers. The thickness of a crystalline silicon absorber layer is therefore limited to about 300 micrometers. As we discussed in the preceding video, amorphous silicon has a much higher defect density than crystalline silicon and therefore a much shorter diffusion length. The typical diffusion length of amorphous silicon is only 100 nanometers up to 300 nanometers. Hence, the transport of charge carriers in a thick absorber cannot rely on diffusion and must rely on drift. Thin film silicon solar cells are therefore sometimes referred to as drift devices. Consequently, Amorphous silicon solar cells are not based on a PN junction, but rather on a PIN junction. This means that an intrinsic layer, meaning a layer that is not intentionally doped, is sandwiched between a P-doped and an N-doped layer. While the intrinsic layer is several hundreds of nanometers thick, the doped layers are only about 10 nanometers thick. Between the P and N doped layers, a built-in electric field is created across the intrinsic layer. This figure shows the P, I, N layers where they are not connected to each other. In this situation, the Fermi level in the P layer is closer to the valence band and the Fermi level in the N layer is closer to the conduction band. 
For the intrinsic layer, the Fermi level is in the middle of the band gap. When the layers are connected to each other and the system is in dark under thermal equilibrium, the Fermi level has to be the same throughout the junction. This creates a slope over the electronic bands in the intrinsic film, which reflects the built-in electric field. Note that there are no majority or minority charge carriers in the absorber layer, since the intrinsic layer is undoped. Drift is therefore solely responsible for charge carrier transport in the absorber layer. Due to the electric field, light excited electrons will move down the slope in the conduction band towards the N-dope layer and the holes will move up the slope in the valence band towards the P-dope layer. Inside the P-dope layer, on the other hand, the holes are the majority charge carriers and the dominant transport mechanism is again diffusion. The same goes for electrons in the endope layer. Because of the low diffusion lengths inside the dope layer, the dope layer must be in fact very, very thin. Let's take a look at a solar cell with a PIN junction. The cell is deposited in superstrate configuration with glass as the superstrate. In thin film silicon, holes have a significantly lower mobility than electrons. The P layer is therefore used as the window layer and deposited first. In this case, the generation rate is higher close to the P layer and more holes can reach it. Between the P layer and glass substrate, a TC TCO layer is deposited to facilitate lateral charge carrier movement to the electrodes. The P layer is followed by the intrinsic absorber layer and the thin and doped layer. Finally, a thin zinc oxide or silicon oxide back reflector is deposited, followed by the metal back contact. The doped amorphous silicon layers have a high defect density and therefore an extremely small diffusion length for its majority charge carriers. As a consequence, unlike traditional solar cells, photogenerated charge carriers in the doped layers of a PIN cell cannot be separated and collected. Light absorption in the doped layers is therefore considered to be parasitic and it does not contribute to the generation of a current. Consequently, dope layers in a PIN cell have a very specific set of requirements. In order to maximize the amount of light reaching the absorber layer, the reflection at the interfaces of the window layer should be minimal. To that end, the refractive index of the P-dope layer should be equal to the geometric mean of that of the TCO layer and the I layer. The N-dope layer, on the other hand, should, be re should reflect as large a fraction as possible back into the absorber layer. Secondly, the dope layer should be transparent to incident light to minimize the parasitic absorption by the doped layer. This could be achieved by having a dope layer with a high band gap energy, so that it's transferred to a large fraction of the incident light. Moreover, a high band gap energy also benefits the built-in potential in the cell, which affects the cell voltage. Finally, the dope layer should be conductive enough for charge carriers to easily move through the material to the electrodes. In other words, the dope layer should have adequate transverse conductivity. Balancing the optical and electrical properties of the dope layers is a delicate process that can strongly influence the device performance. Time for a recap. We discussed the two transport mechanisms for charge carrier in solar cells and we saw that for thin film amorphous cells diffusion cannot be used. We looked into device structure of a superstrate PIN cell and finally we considered the specific requirements of the dope layers in a PIN junction. In the next video we will discuss a range of silicon alloys that are used for a PIN cell.